Okay, really. Oh, it's gone. Let's see. Where are we at? Hey, hello. Oh, hello. hey. Hi, how are you? Uh, not, not that great today, but we'll... Uh, oh, no! <laughs> well, we want to thank you, I guess. Uh, thank yeah, you for doing thank this. you for doing this. Yeah. So, um, we'll just, I guess we'll just go ahead and get, go yeah, just um, jump in. Do you sure. have any questions or... <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I'm Izzy. Hello. Hi, how are you? Um, so we're interviewing you as creators of the Digital Manifesto Archive. We're particularly... Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, we are particularly interested in having a conversation with you about your manifesto's intervention in the genre. Um, we want to ask a seemingly simple question. Why write a manifesto? <laughs> Given your ha your hacker manifesto's rhetoric, it invokes the communist manifesto, a stylistic gesture to uh, Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle. We see your manifesto as very much self-reflexive of its own participation in uh, man the manifesto's political legacy. So as an author, how did the, this legacy inform your decision to write a hacker manifesto? Well, I, I always uh, really loved the manifesto form. Uh, I loved it as a genre, uh, whether as uh, a political or a, an aesthetic avant-garde kind mm -hmm. of form. And uh, I, I was involved in, you know, what I thought at the time was an avant-garde. So I thought, well, it should have a manifesto. Yeah. And a, a lot of people had had that idea. And there, were, there were a lot of them. Uh, so, yeah, it was, I think, a self, fairly self-conscious attempt to write uh, a manifesto of the uh, kind of digital underground of that time. Okay, I mean, there's, um, you know, I think about your, when I think about your manifesto, and I think it's like sort of a combination of the kind of conceptual work that's going on and its, its relationship to the genre, I think about it as a kind of a text that executes a hack, right, in the sense that you write about the concept of a hack, or like this affirmation of an abstract or kind of virtual plane from which a kind of a novel political forms, novel concepts might arise. And so, you know, what we don't see in your manifesto, for instance, is a kind of um, like a ten-point program, you know, for um, how sort of maybe the revolution is supposed to take place. And so I'm wondering, you know, what does it mean to sort of uh, if that's maybe a good reading of, <laughs> of the hacker manifesto? Um, what does it mean to hack the manifesto, this sort of explicitly maybe politicized genre and aesthetic genre, and what what possibilities uh, arise as a result? Well, I mean, to say too much about uh, future possible worlds would be to write a different genre, which is yeah. quite uh, utopia. Yeah. Uh, and nor is it a transitional program. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a place for programmatic language, but I actually don't think it's in manifestos. The Communist Manifesto of the United States does both, and the first mm -hmm. half is a manifesto, and the second half is a transitional program. Mm -hmm. uh, and they actually have very different styles, uh, and were written by different people. Yeah, the second half right. by Engels. Uh, we don't. No one remembers it. Yeah. Because it's like you know, I. Universal suffrage and free education. It's like, what, what terrible radical ideas. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, I, I tell you know, students are always really like, we're going to the Communist Manifesto, isn't that a radical document? It's yeah. like, wait till you read the second half. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. right. Yeah, put all power in the hands of the state thing didn't work out. You know, that was bad. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it, you know, I think you'll probably like it. You know? Yeah. So, yes, but to... Um, uh, well, hack, yeah, uh, as a way of thinking what the situation is called detournement, mm -hmm. uh, the, the sense of all of uh, culture and art and technology as a commons. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what would be a literary form that, that embodies that sense that this already belongs to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, so it sort of uses uh, other people's language. Uh, right. You know, it's not, uh, it's not like conceptual literature, which straight up takes the original text. Uh, it copies and corrects uh, and transforms the language, or mm -hmm. well, several of them. Uh, and so it would be, you know, Marx, Debord, and Deleuze would be the big three right. uh, languages that it, that it sort of appropriates. But I think that the thing for me about Manifesto is it attaches, it, it, it sort of uh, cleaves the whole world according to a certain point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a cut through reality mm -hmm. uh, where the two things that constitute each other. So the cut and the actor who performs it constitute each other in the act of its composition. Mm -hmm. To me, that's interesting because um, I, I study the genre, and you know, there's a there's been this sort of emerging scholarship, essentially claiming the the, the genre, the manifesto genre, is obsolete. You know, and I think of when I think of this, uh, you know, Hart Negri's declaration: "This is not a manifesto." <laughs> 
um, right? And I think that what they're really saying is obsolete there is a kind of, a kind of programmatic and prophetic uh, kind of political move. You know, your interpretation of what the genre does is interesting because I think, I think it's you know something. Uh, contemporary political movements probably still have something to gain from the manifesto genre. It's not something that is entirely obsolete. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if you um, perhaps agree. Um, do contemporary political movements still have something to gain from the genre? And is conceptualizing a kind of a virtual manifesto or, or a manifesto that executes a hack in that sense? Um, still a, a potentially valuable political experiment. Well, I mean, Hart and Negri can't really do the, the manifesto because there's, you know, perhaps not really too precise a sense of who the social actor would be. Right, um, right. Start to call it multitude, it's not, you know, uh, so it's, it's more that the theory itself excludes yes. that genre. Uh, but maybe, you know, maybe the theory's wrong, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, is this just something a little too, you know, blamange like about uh, the idea of uh, multitude mm -hmm. whereas what really happened I think is a proliferation of them I mean they're everywhere right. everybody writes them now and why shouldn't they you know like why shouldn't they be manifestos of you know multiple kinds mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think the reverse happened it actually became a popular genre right. uh, there's, there's dozens I mean I, I stole the title right it's uh, there is the hacker manifesto already right yeah uh, just made it A in the sense yeah. that <laughs> And that was a hard part to translate, it turned out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it was written to be translatable into any European language. We are the only ones I know. Uh, and the, the, of the three words in the title, it's A that you can't translate. Because most languages don't have articles. You know? Right, right. Uh, so, in French, so in French, it's un, like one. Right, right. <laughs> and, and in German, it's just Tacker Manifest, which leaves out the sense. Um, and it's like, why did you steal Mentor's title? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But only works in English. Yeah. <laughs> whereas, whereas, you know, hacker became this, this loan word and into every other language. And manifesto is a loan word into English and right. into every language you could possibly name, uh, from one end of Europe to the other, mm -hmm. and, and indeed elsewhere. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a sense that, you know, through that act of writing this thing that was meant to be translatable, having it translated, and you've realized there's whole families of uh, manifestos that it's then touching base with in all these other universes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I actually think it's um, uh, the, the form of manifesto survived the postmodern moment when mm -hmm. uh, it was supposed to no longer be possible to think uh, the temporal difference between pasts and presents, which is the rate. Right. As Jamison says, that's modernism, is any figure uh, where past and present are not transitive. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so I read it. Uh, and, and so, you know, well, actually, we're still in that, which is this interregnum where no one understood uh, direction in history, but I think it's back. Right. So I want to transition to what are some possible contemporary contexts in which your manifesto is particularly informative. Um, in a clear partisan relation, you claim that private property is the enemy of information, right, in a hacker manifesto. To begin, will you perhaps uh, talk about some ways in which the struggle to liberate information has changed since you authored the manifesto? Yeah, yeah and, and what I usually say is we won the battle and lost the war. Uh -huh. So, uh, but that's how it is with avant-garde, yeah. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Get recuperated into history and into the, particularly in, in, into the commodity form, yeah. but also modifying it slightly. Uh, so, so I think recuperation and detournement are still the two key terms in a way, uh, you, know, or, you know, one of which you repurposes the hack. Right. So, yeah, we, we won, like information became free, uh, you know, and everybody except the people whose entire business is based on owning it uh, sort of recognizes that it's actually a lot better if it's a commons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, within certain boundaries, obviously, you know, if it kind of circulates. And, uh, and, and that's clear on the, on the copyright side. The paint side is a little more complicated because there's so much more money involved. Um, but I think the courts are starting to recognize that this, like, you know, patenting the minutia of everything is, is a real barrier to any kind of technological growth and transformation. You know, so, so you know, there's a sense in which we won, but also a sense in which uh, everything got recuperated at a higher level. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I first started writing in about 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, this is before anybody even knows what Google is. Right. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah, to, like, you know, go find stuff for yourself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that surfing the internet thing was real? Because you had no idea what to do. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm just going to go over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Using, uh, you 
know, FTP protocols. Like, you know, FTP protocols. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's this sense in which uh, what we now have is a version of commodification that relies on information being free so that you can recuperate it at a higher level by owning and controlling the metadata, for example, right. by aggregating it mm -hmm. uh, through information asymmetry of, of knowing more about what's in it. So you give a little bit to us mere consumers, but we have to give so much more. Non-labor has been commodified, right? So mm -hmm. all of these things we do, someone's making a living off it. Uh, so it all got recuperated at a higher level. So one would have to then sort of think what new strategies are. But I think the the for me at least the class analysis in that text is absolutely right, and it explains this. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it explains how uh, a new class arose. Yeah. Uh, that's just much much more interesting in in controlling everything through control of some aspect of the data flow, uh, right. either by controlling the pipe or by uh, controlling the metadata or having access to the big data aggregate or uh, knowing what the algorithm is when us. You know, even businesses who are clients don't know what the algorithm is that's generating mm -hmm. the result. Uh, so, yeah, I think the analysis worked. It's just that, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we won some battles and lost the war and it got recuperated at a high level. Right, right. There's been, um, we, we recently uh, interviewed um, uh, Yuk Yukui. Yeah, Yukui, Yukui, who writes about the archive and really theorizes this as a problem of the archive. Um, these problems of metadata, uh, Google the, and Facebook, um, you know, these sort of like... Um, <laughs> We are laboring for these, for the profit of these corporations, and you know he really approaches this through this kind of almost phenomenological. It is a phenomenological approach of this concept of care and, and caring for the archive. So I'm, I'm wondering. I mean, maybe I could pose that question uh, to you in that sense. Is this? Do you see this as a problem of the archive, of of can maybe control over the archive or of producing personal archives that would combat that um, that you know being recuperated into that that higher level. It's interesting that um, you know people I knew in the what I think of as the, the net time moment of yeah. avant uh -huh. uh, What some of them are now interested in is is precisely uh, maintaining archives that are offline. Yeah. Uh, and indexing. So it's you know hoarding the stuff is just a tiny part of the problem. Right. Is is can there be the people's indexing so they have access and know what's in it? Mm -hmm. So I think it's really interesting. And, and I just follow what creative people do, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, oh, so you guys have figured out that archive is, is part of the problem. Yeah. Uh, so now I'm you know, writing something about that with those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, uh, uh, my friend Trevor Schultz sent me an email saying, I, I have something I want to give you, but I don't want to say what it is, and we have to meet in person. Uh -huh. and, and so I, so I texted him back, I'm, I'm free now. Yeah. Like, that's so, that sounds so awesome. Like, yeah. you know, I want to know now. Uh -huh. And so he, he gives me a hard drive. You know, and it had fifty thousand books on it, and then, wow. uh, you know, and then he tells me the story of who created it. It was somebody's thesis project, mm -hmm. uh, and and also it's indexed and curated, uh, and it's like, wow. wow, that is like a gift. It's it's, it's like that's that's a civilization. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then I'm, but like any gift, I'm obligated. I have to do something with it. Mm -hmm. So can I add things to it before I give it to people, or does that change the nature of the artwork? I think I can add stuff. Can I take stuff off? I actually disagree with some of those selections. So can they, Can I fork it? And that's right, stuff. yeah. So it's like, that's just the most amazing artwork anybody ever just gave me. <laughs> yeah. I don't imagine the labor involved just even in collecting. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Making sure all of the files work. Like just the, It's just an oh, enormous labor of love. Uh, and yeah. I don't even know if I'm supposed to say whose work it is. You know? mm -hmm. uh, but awesome. The one thing I, I just caution, though, is uh, to not just see the tech sector as the only part of commodification that change. Uh, uh, so it's a slightly different topic, but if, if you look at, uh, you know, the top, uh, say, 50 Fortune 500 companies in America, they all rule through the control of information. Mm -hmm. Like, number one is Walmart. You know, yeah. it's a data company. It's a logistics mm -hmm. company. Like, that's what they do. The fact that they, you know, have leases for stores is kind of irrelevant. <laughs> Right. Uh, you know, you look at all the drug companies that are in the, the top 50, you know, they're in the data business. Like, they don't even make the damn drugs. Some other contractor mm. makes the thing, yeah? It's all about, you know, extracting data out of chemistry. Like, that's what they do. Uh, you know, and so on. Uh, the car companies. It turned out in 2008, there was more money in the car loans than in the cars. Exactly, yeah. That's yeah. why they went broke. It's mm -hmm. nothing to do with cars. It's that they were basically data companies because they knew more about who was buying cars and they right. leveraged that data asymmetry. Even the oil companies, which are the most massive companies in the world, <laughs> you know, 
I mean, it's it's basically information about where the oil is and mm-hmm. owning the leases on those things mm-hmm. and knowing what the technology is about. But mm-hmm. I don't necessarily own all of this stuff. Yeah, no. it's not capitalism of the traditional kind. It's you know control through data or what I call the vectorless class. Right. So yeah, there's a sense in which if you think archive uh, in this much much broader, bigger kind of way, that's essentially it is control through information. Uh, so if you, you can kind of cleave the world through that principle, uh, well, you know, whose interest is that really? That's right. So our last co- question follows from the previous one. We want to ask you about the tension between knowledge and education. Um, you wrote that education is slavery, <laughs> it enchains the mind, it makes knowledge a resource for class power. Um, the contemporary university model in the U.S. and abroad is becoming more corporatized. Um, at the very same time, we've seen the rise of you know, new media, digital humanities, maker culture, and academic discourses. So while there are discussions about how one might hack education in these emerging areas, hacking doesn't always cohere with the use with your use of the term. Um, do you see the university as a site of struggle that extends from the argument? Um, and if so, do you see these emerging areas in the humanities as productive hacks in the divide between education and knowledge. Mm. Well, there's always a struggle over the language. And, mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, in the 18th century, the word Democrat meant pretty much what we now use the word terrorist for. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, now we're all supposed to be Democrats. We're mm. supposed to gift it to the world. Uh, you know, that really wasn't what that word meant you know, 200 years ago. So one struggles around the word hacker that uh, on the one hand gets criminalized, on the other hand is associated with you know, dude, just because you made some stupid app doesn't make you a hack. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a job, you know. Like the yeah. real work of building the infrastructure that makes all that possible is 50 years in the making or more. Mm-hmm. Like those were the real hackers, yeah. Mm-hmm. The people who made the infrastructure so that you can just like tool around and, and you know, it's like, oh, it'll have like cute frogs. Yeah. And whatever, you know? <laughs> Nine cats uh, and yeah. <laughs> You know, or it's it's like Tinder for cats. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, this is just work now, you know. Uh, but it's it's work where the individuals who do it are made to, to bear all the risk. You know, like that's the startup model. And you'll get a fraction of what it's worth if it's worth something. Right. Uh, you know, you, you don't get it all. Uh, and your regular mom and pop investors are kept way out of this. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you really only, you, if you come in, you know, venture capital sort of hedges its bets. Uh uh, and reaps the rewards, mm-hmm. um, you know, because, you know, it knows these will lose, these will win on average, you know, we'll collect either way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those poor schmucks bore most of the real risk. You know, so there's there's a sense in which, you know, this is not what hacking's about, you know, it's, it's never about uh, making money, it's about reputation, you know, it's about yeah. people, rec- you know, people who do what you do, do they recognize what you're doing as worthwhile, you know, that's, that's sort of really the driver. And there's a paradoxical connection between uh, reputation and gift economy. It's mm-hmm. only if everybody shares and knows everything that you can actually have the reputation. Mm-hmm. That was what's you know kind of strangely socially paradoxical about those worlds. Yeah. So I think one has to struggle to uh, uh, retrieve the meaning of that. Uh, but yeah, um, education turned out to be a much more fraught uh, field than even I imagined. And, mm-hmm. You know circa 2000 when I was writing this thing. Uh, yeah, so uh, that uh, commodification would work its way through the information trades. Uh, I think I had some inkling that that was going to happen, but mm-hmm. it's, it's certainly where we are now. Mm-hmm. And then the subordination of all of these things to debt uh, as you know, partly as means of control, partly that we have no other way of assessing what anything is worth but to put it in a huge market. So it's the other information systems that are, that are really kind of lagging behind. It's kind of the only one we've got. Uh, and, you know, it's like um, there is an element of uh, let's just eat the seed corn uh, to all of this. You know, I mean, the United States has no future except one based on uh, knowledge. Uh, but, mm-hmm. you know, let's make some cheap, quick money uh, by, you know, sort of commodifying and privatizing all that. Uh, basically, this big business has got no new ideas. Uh, yeah. It's like, oh, well, let's, let's get the state to let us take over all the stuff the state used to do better. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Or the quasi quasi state institutions in America, which most universities are, yeah, whether public or private, they're <laughs> yeah. quasi state mm-hmm. uh, in, in terms of how they're funded. Uh, so now nah, let, let's just you know let's you know force the state to let us take over all of that uh, for you know short term gains. 
you know, think meanwhile the world is still, if they had money, they send their kids here for education. Right. Uh, because of the quality of what was built up for over 100 years. So, yeah, what's happening in education is kind of a tragedy in that sense. Uh, we, can, we can no longer think of it as public good. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, that's, um, I don't really have a follow up. I mean, I don't know. I think that's like a sort of, um, I, we're going to have to wait and see. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs>